Dr. Stephen Shoemaker has analyzed the Quran using the same critical analysis that scholars have applied to the Bible for years, and he has dared to publish his results. Why has it taken so long for a serious scholar to do this? We named this series in honor of this book, Reading the Quran by Stephen Shoemaker. Today we're going to address the issue of fear. In other words, why is there fear uh, by scholars, I should say, um, in terms of confronting the standard Islamic narrative? Dr. J, welcome back as always. And I think you and I alluded to this fear in the past. Why do you think there is this fear of confronting the standard Islamic narrative, even from an academic, benign academic approach? Well, uh, there, there are many reasons for it. Uh, I think if we're going to get into that, I think we'll be, we need to uh, first start with what Shoemaker is saying. Again, we want to make sure that we keep on tack with Shoemaker. And Shoemaker quotes this, and he brings this up as a real problem. He says this on page two of his book. Modern scholarship on the Quran, with some notable exceptions, has been largely governed by traditional Islamic views on the Quran. Traditional are what we know the standard Islamic exactly. narrative. That's the Hadith, that's the Tafsir, that's the Tahrik, and the Sirah, those four genres. Uh, that it has been geared and pushed and formulated by al-Buhari and others. That's what all modern scholarship has just used that verbatim. They've never questioned it. He goes on and says, the historical critical study of its texts remain under the powerful influence of the Islamic tradition's gravitational pull at times without even fully realizing it. So what he's saying is, listen, many of the scholars don't even know they're doing it. They don't even understand. They have no idea that they're not applying what was done to the Bible and other books, but mainly the Bible, those same categories, the same criticisms, textual criticism and, and, and others, that which is applied has been since the 1800s, since the German school in Tübingen started doing it, Wellhausen and others, which was, which was uh, needed at that time. That has not been done today. That's all he's saying. Now, what his solution is, and he goes, and let me just quote again on that same page. He says, we must not study the origins of the Quran according to the convictions of the later Islamic tradition. And I like later. Okay, he puts that in there purposely because yeah. you saw the timeline from the last episode. It is two to three hundred years later. Right. And he says, but instead we must use the standard tools of historical criticism that scholars have long applied to the study of other sacred scripture writings. Now, like the, really, Bible. the only other one has been the Bible. Really, there's been nothing done on the Upanishads or the Vedas or the uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita. There's nothing, but the Book of Mormon, uh, all these other scriptures, no one has had this test done to it except the Bible. He does. I don't know why he didn't say the Bible there. He's saying other writers because there may be some minor studies that have been done on yeah. them. So that's why he's saying this needs to be done to the Quran. Yeah, and, and, and if you remember, Jay, at some point he would say it's almost like any, Islam, uh, I should say, in, in any uh, religious studies program, you, you find like two tracks, one focus on Islamic studies and one focus on everything else. It's almost like instead of doing the same thing, there is always this bias or this fear and you do something different when it comes to Islam versus other religions. And what has happened is, unlike any other area of study, you start any, any scientific area, any study of humanities, any study on even religious texts, there's never been there has never been a kickback uh, by anybody from within that tradition against what they're saying. In fact, most people say if you find something new, for heaven's sakes, publish it, and they get peer reviewed. And when you get peer reviewed, it's actually a great critical, it's a great critical exercise. That's why you want to be peer reviewed, because you want to make sure that what you're saying can stand up to criticism. And nobody has bothered that except when it comes to Islam. When it comes to Islam, no one, no one wants to be peer reviewed. Why? Well, here's the problem. Let's just go and see what he quotes. This is on uh, page two and three. Many contemporary Muslims object to non-Muslims taking their sacred text and subjecting it to independent critical analysis based in another intellectual tradition that is markedly different from their own faith perspective. Already, can you see a problem there? Yep. So it's the Muslims who have object, objected to anybody applying a critical analysis on it. And when they object, suddenly people re uh, re uh, re recoil. Why do they recoil? Well, it's why? The usual standard, he continues you know? on. Yeah. It strikes the Muslims as offensive. 
perhaps understandably, that an outsider would come along and tell them what their sacred text really is and how it should be understood. No one is saying what it should, how it should be understood. No one's doing that with the critical. See, even that statement is, is erroneous. Muslims don't understand. We're not telling them what, how they're to believe or how they're to act or how they're to practice the religion. No one's saying that. All we're asking is, is it true? Asking critical questions. Uh, don't Muslims ask critical questions of the Bible all the time? Okay. Why is that acceptable? Absolutely. See, we don't give death threats. And interestingly, Shoemaker doesn't say that. That even, he can't even say that. And I said, well, Shoemaker, say exactly what you mean. Look at the Taslim and Nasrins of the world, or the, or the Salman Rushdies of the world, or the uh, 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 Taha Hussein. Look what's happened to these guys from within the Islamic tradition. They're Muslims themselves. Look and see what they, has happened to them when they've been critical of the Quran. They've lost their lives or they've been attempted. Look at Salman Rushdie a few weeks ago. He almost got killed for some, uh, uh, a book that he wrote in 1988. This is 2022 and he almost got killed a few weeks ago. This is the problem that all, uh, all academics have. They don't want to end up like Salman Rushdie. They don't want to end up like Taha Hussein or Taslim al I mean, the word, or Ghanouchi. I mean, there's so many names you could add to that or any of us who you and me, in fact, look at the death threats we get just by asking simple historical questions of Muhammad and the Quran and Mecca. Look at all the death threats. Look at the comments we get on our, uh, our, our, our uh, YouTube channels. No one wa in academia wants that kind of grief or that kind of hassle, especially when you realize that my, much of your funding comes from the very, uh, the very people that you're criticizing, because much of the funding for a lot of our institutions here in the West, including the United States and in Europe, it comes from uh, petrodollars coming from the Middle East. For and the Islamic studies centers and uh, programs, is that what you're saying? Exactly, that's what yeah. I meant. Yeah. The Islamic studies, the, uh, the uh, Middle Eastern studies are almost all funded by Middle Eastern, by Middle Eastern countries. So you cannot, interestingly, this is the only area of study, and we've said this many times, where what you find, you cannot say publicly for fear of what will happen to your, your research, what will happen to your like a salary, and what would happen to your life. You could be vilified uh, as well, and you could lose your job. So, um, I mean, sadly, uh, that's what happens. So what happens? Well, this is, he, uh, um, Shoemaker then continues and he says, uh, uh, and he quotes actually uh, Lincoln in 2007. About censorship. About censorship. And Bruce Lincoln says this. He says, with the possible exceptions of economics, our religious studies in Islam is the only academic field that is effectively organized to protect its putative object of study against critical examination. Well, that's, that's, that's it right there. It is the only place I know any of any other study where you cannot say what you find or you cannot you cannot publicly publish what you have researched. That's right. Well, I mean, I hope everyone is noticing how uh, interesting uh, this uh, video series is going to be and also how interesting many of these quotations that we are reading for you from this book. So w what do you think we are going to uh, address or what are we going to focus on moving forward from here? Well, moving forward, I want to know where this, all, where this, uh, this self censorship came from. Where did this idea that we can't critically anal analyze, we can't use critical historical material on the Quran or, the, or on Muhammad or on the, uh, the place itself. Now, it's obviously that there must, there, this must have started from somewhere or someone. Mm -hmm. Shoemaker answers that question. He's going to go and he's actually going to put his finger on who that someone is. It actually started with one man uh, in the last century. But I'm not going to say who it is yet. You're going to have to see the episode because I agree with him. I, when I did my doctoral thesis, this came out. I did a, a whole half a chapter on this guy and others who said the main thing. But it was this one man that actually was the impetus that created this environment, which in some ways came out of necessity because of the reality that exists on the ground. Mm -hmm. and, but yet when he was talking, this reality didn't exist. Radical Islam hadn't really shown its face. We don't did have the Al-Qaeda's or the Boko Haram's or the Al-Shabaab's. We didn't have ISIS back then in the last century. So it's fascinating that he came up, we're gonna, I'm kind of getting ahead of the ball, but I want to show you if this is something that's not recent. This is something that didn't just come by happenstance and it didn't come by the situation, the reality that's happening that we have today, which is much more critical, which is much more dangerous. It happened in a time when there was an environment, a very benign environment, which is absolutely surprising. However, 
We do need to unpack it. We do need to go to this individual. We do need to see what he said, and we need to say how is it and why is it that that became such a hugely important uh, ethos of what then ha we're seeing all, re represented right across the boards, not only in the United States, but in Europe, in fact, in almost all of our Western academic institutions. Amen. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Hopefully, you will watch a continuation of this video series, and you will enjoy the many uh, quotations on arguments and even uh, our own opinions in relationship to many of the contents that we will be addressing. Uh, with me here in studio, of course, to unpack all of that, not just today, but uh, continuing on with this series is our dear brother, Dr. Jay Smith. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.